Take a quick look at worksheet number 17. We had 9, 10, and 11 due for homework. We're going to take a look at question number 11. It says, determine the critical angle for diamond. There's a couple of things that we know about total internal reflection. One, in order for it to occur, we have to be going from blank index of refraction to blank index of refraction. Fill in the blanks. We have to be going from low to high or high to low? High to low, yeah. We can never go from low to high. We still get refraction taking place every time we go from low index to high index. Now, going from high to low, we can still get refraction taking place, but if we exceed the second criterion for, for total internal reflection to take place, that is the critical angle, then we will get reflection taking place as opposed to refraction. So we have to assume in this question that we're exceeding or we're at the critical angle, and we're going from high index to low index refraction. There's the boundary between diamond and air. We'll make this our diamond, which has an index refraction of 2.42. We'll make this our air, which has an index refraction of 1.00. We're going from diamond, medium one, to air, medium two. Again, going the other way around, we'd still get refraction, but no reflection would take place. We got a ray of light going from the diamond this way to the air, gonna speed up, Angle is going to increase. In fact, at the critical angle, the angle of refraction is going to increase to the point where it becomes 90 degrees. When we're solving this question to solve for the critical angle, we're going to say sine theta 1 over sine theta 2, this is Snell's law, equals, you could say V1 over V2, but it makes sense to say N2 over N1 since we have the indices of refraction. Theta 1 becomes theta C, the critical angle. Theta 2 becomes 90 degrees, always 90 degrees when you're looking for theta C. And 2 is 1.00 over 2.42. Remember, we're going from medium 1 to medium 2. Medium 1 was diamond, medium 2 is air, so it's 1 over 2.42. Sine 90 is 1, so it makes life a little bit easier mathematically for me here. Uh, if that's 1, then it just becomes... 1 over 2.42 gives me a value of 0.413, and then we take the inverse sine of that, and we end up getting 24.4 degrees. The critical angle for water you found, sorry, for our crown glass you found in question number 9 was 41 degrees. The critical angle for diamond is 24 degrees. The critical angle for diamond is so much smaller because the index of refraction is so much bigger. Now, somebody asked a good question this morning. said, um, can you get total internal reflection taking place um, between, say, diamond and glass as opposed to diamond and air? Do you think you can? Sure you can, as long as you're going from high index of refraction to low index of refraction. What you'll notice is this, though. Okay, um, The bigger the difference in index of refraction the smaller the critical angle. So you would find if you went from diamond to glass, you would still get a critical angle. You could still get reflection taking place, but the critical angle would be bigger. The bigger the difference in index, and here we got a pretty big difference, right? One and 2.42, the, the smaller the critical angle. If we went from 2.42 to 1.5, which is about the index of refraction for glass, then we would still get a critical angle, but it would be a larger value because it's smaller difference in index of refraction. Mathematically, it would work exactly the same. Still sine 90, it just wouldn't be 1 over 2.42, it would be 1.5 over 2.42. All right? Let's have a look at an application of refraction. You can see up on the board right now two different types of curved lenses. We call them lenses are... Uh, pieces of glass or plastic or some other material that are shaped in such a way as to refract light in predictable ways to produce predictable images. You can see the first kind of lens that we have is called a converging or convex lens. The second kind is called a diverging or concave lens. The convex lens or the converging lens is thicker in the middle than it is at the edges. It's not always exactly the shape that I have it drawn here, but it will always be thicker in the middle than it is at the edges. The concave or the diverging is always going to be thinner in the middle or caved in in the middle. 
concave, caved in. Thinner in the middle than it is at the edges. Again, it may take a slightly different shape. Like my eyeglasses don't look exactly like that. But if I take my eyeglasses off and look, you guys looked at them, you would see that they're thinner in the middle than they are at the edges. They're concave or they're diverging. Now, we call the first one a concave or converging, I should say, lens, because all rays of light that are parallel to this imaginary line that we draw straight through the middle of this lens called the principal axis, all rays of light parallel to that end up converging at a specific spot. We call that spot the focal length of the lens. It's a converging lens because all rays of light converge at that focal point. Why do they converge there? Well, because the lens is shaped such that Snell's law guides them in that direction. I mean, clearly that has to be a pretty specific shape for Snell's law to guide all of those rays in that particular direction to that particular spot, but it is. Now, a diverging lens is called a diverging lens because all rays of light parallel to the principal axis of that lens, they don't converge at a focal point. Rather, they diverge away from a certain spot. If I extend them all backwards, they diverge away from that spot that we call the focal point. Rays converge in the first one, rays diverge in the second one. You can see in the second diagram here, there's a picture of an eye. This is a person like myself or like those of you, most likely at least, that need glasses. People that are nearsighted. That means we can see near. We're nearsighted. I can see nearby. When I pick up this piece of paper here, if I was to look at it without glasses, I could read it just fine. But if I look at something far off, I can't see it. That's because the rays of light that are coming into the convex or converging lens in my eye converge in front of my retina. We want them to converge on my retina, but they don't. They converge in front of my retina. So I have to spread them apart a little bit with this diverging lens here in order to get them to come together a little bit further back on my retina. So I put a diverging lens in front of my eye to cause them to come together a little bit further back, a couple millimeters further back on my retina. Now you guys know that if, you, if I take my glasses off, I'm still getting able to see light. Light's still striking my retina right here. It's just that it's not focused because it's not converging at that spot. Now, when I get older, when you guys get older, you'll almost certainly need reading glasses. I'll need bifocals. Most of you guys will need reading glasses. And that's because the muscles in my eye will weaken to the point where they can't change the shape of the lens of my eye well enough. What we're going to find is the rays of light will then converge back here behind the retina. So then what we'd have to do is stick a converging lens in front of my eye to cause them to come together a little bit quicker and have them converge up here on the retina of my eye. Does that make sense? So diverging if you're nearsighted, converging if you're farsighted. What I want to do now is draw some diagrams that will allow me to predict what the image as I look through a lens is going to look like. You can see back in this picture at the very beginning of this lesson here, you can see that sometimes maybe a converging lens will produce an image that is bigger in right side up. Sometimes it'll produce an image, this water droplet is a converging lens, right? Same shape basically as a, as a magnifying glass, thicker in the middle than it is at the edges, but it produces an image that's smaller and upside down. How do we predict whether we're going to see this or this or something different altogether? We draw array diagrams. In this one, you can see that the object, as represented by the arrow, is pretty far away from the lens. This dot is going to be called F. This is going to be simply 2F. It's a spacer, just telling us that, all right, that distance is twice the distance of the focal length away from the lens. 
over here. We're not even going to label these as f and 2f. They're just, again, spacers. They correspond to the distance of f and 2f, but they don't have any significance other than spacing. So this object, let's say it's a bald guy. It's a bald guy because lots of rays of light reflect off of the head of a bald guy. There's millions of rays of light that reflect off of this guy, but there are two specific ones that reflect off of his shiny bald head that are very predictable, what happens to them. The first one that I want to look at is the one that reflects parallel to the principal axis. What happens to that one? Keep in mind, you guys, I'm, I'm only picking this one because it's predictable. There's a million other ones that I could have picked. This one is easy to pick because it's predictable what happens to it. Every ray of light that is parallel to the principal axis goes where? Through the focal point. So this ray of light will refract or bend down through the focal point. Now, the way that I drew this, I lied a little bit. You actually get some bending here and then some more bending here, right? As it goes into the glass and then out of the glass. Don't worry about what happens in between. Okay, ultimately, what you see here and here is what ends up happening. We're simplifying what happens in between because it doesn't really matter. It gets us the same answer. We don't have to calculate angles or anything if we do it this way. Now, one more ray of light is going to allow us to see what the image of this tall blonde or tall uh, bald guy is going to look like here. Second ray is going to go from the top of his shiny bald head again, down through what we call the optical center right here. Optical center, the geometric center of this lens. And it's going to keep going straight through. The reality is, of course, it actually bends a couple of times as it goes in and out, but the net effect is it ends up going in this direction. So that's what we're going to draw because it's easier. Here's my object. Here's my guy with a shiny bald head. His feet are at the principal axis. His head is up here above the principal axis. The image of him that we see is over here. His feet are at the principal axis. His shiny bald head is where the rays of light converge. Since they came from his bald head, they're going to converge at the image of his bald head. Now we're going to describe three characteristics or attributes of this image. Number one, it doesn't really matter, matter what order we do them in, but go with the order that I pick here. Number one, we want to determine whether the image is larger smaller, or is it the same size as the object is? Now, some people have a little bit of trouble with this, only because they're not sure what they're looking for. Look at the size of the image, literally. Measure the size of the image using a ruler or with your fingers or whatever. This image is a certain amount high right here. If we go back to our object, clearly the object is bigger than the image. So we would say our image is smaller than the object. The image is smaller than the object. If you have trouble telling, like physically use a ruler and measure. Now the second characteristic or attribute is its orientation. Sometimes they call it its attitude. Thank you. Is it right side up or upright? Or is it inverted? Well, our object is clearly upright. Our image looks to be upside down. The image is upside down, so we say it's inverted. We know that it's upside down because the image always starts at the principal axis and then goes either up or down to where the rays intersect. Since we have to go down to where the rays intersect, it must be an inverted image, an upside down image. 
The third one is going to be a little bit tricky. It's going to relate to whether we have an image that can be projected onto a screen like you saw in the demonstration I did a few minutes ago or not. Sometimes I can put the image right onto a screen like I just did. Sometimes I've got to physically look into the lens to see it. When you walk into the bathroom in the morning and you look in the mirror, you see your image. But you have to look into the mirror to see it. You're not projecting the image of yourself onto the wall. You just see yourself when you look into the mirror. That's a virtual image. If you can project it onto a screen, like at a movie theater when they project the movie onto the screen, okay, that's a real image. This is a real image. This can be projected onto a screen. We know this is a real image because solid lines are intersecting as opposed to dotted lines. Now, we haven't seen a diagram yet where we have dotted lines, but when we do, you'll see that, okay, it's a little bit different here. Trust me on it for now. Solid lines are intersecting. That means that it's a real image. That means that we could, if we wanted to, project it onto a screen. Here's our second scenario here now. We had an object that was beyond 2F, right? F, 2F, our object distance, the distance from the object to the lens is beyond 2F. It's greater than 2F. This time, our object distance is equal to 2F. So it's a little bit closer to the lens this time. F, 2F, and of course, this is our principal axis right here. We draw the same two rays. We got our bald guy with the shiny head walked a little closer to the lens. The first ray of light reflects off of his head parallel to the principal axis, and it refracts down through the focal point. You could figure out that if you did a fairly complicated Snell's Law analysis. The good news is we don't have to figure it out every time. If it's parallel to the principal axis, we just know that it will end up going through the focal point. Second ray goes from the top of his shiny head down through the optical center. He's going straight through the optical center. Here you can see these lines are intersecting right below 2F. His feet are at the principal axis, just like they were in the, in the original object. His head is where the rays intersect because they came, they originated at his head, they end or intersect at his head. This image also has three attributes or three characteristics. Larger, smaller, same size. Same size. The image of the man is the same size as the object, as the man itself. Upright or inverted, right side up, upside down. This one's pretty clear, isn't it? This one's inverted. And then the tricky one, or at least the tricky one for now, is it real or virtual? It's real. This could be projected onto a screen. We know that because solid lines are intersecting. Solid versus dotted. I'm not sure what the application of a lens like this would be. I'm not sure why you'd want to take an object, produce an image that's exactly the same size, but upside down. But that's what would happen. The next diagram that we see is going to have a pretty clear application to it. The next one, we're going to put our, our object at a distance greater than the focal length, but smaller than 2F. So in other words, it's going to be in between F and 2F. First ray goes off. Guy's shiny head down through the focal point. Second ray is going to go down through the optical center. They're going to converge over here somewhere on the right-hand side. From the principal axis down to where they converge, that's our image. What are my characteristics? Was it larger, smaller, same size? Look at this. Look at this red image compared to the black object there. Larger, smaller, same size. In this case, it's dramatically larger, right? Is it upright or inverted? 
It's inverted. It's upside down again. And is it real or virtual? It's going to be real. We could project this onto a screen if we wanted to. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to. We could just look into the lens and see the image, but we can project it onto a screen if we wish, if we want to. I told you this one's going to have a pretty um, fairly obvious application to it. Does anybody know what it would be? Nope. Your guess, but nope. With a magnifying glass, you cannot project the image onto a screen. You physically have to look through the magnifying glass to see it, right? Philip? Yeah, it's like a, a movie theater projector or literally the projector you're looking at right now. The image has got to be bigger, right? You take an object that's inside the projector that's really, really small, and you make it bigger. Wait a second, though. It's upside down. I don't know about you guys, but I've never gone to a movie where the image has been upside down on the screen. Yeah, in a movie theater, you actually have a second lens, but there would be a way around that as well. And what would the simple way around that be? Yeah, put your object upside down. If you project your object up, put your object upside down, then your image will be right side up. Just flip it all over, right? Oh, here's the next one. This one's, this one's neat here. When the object distance is at the focal length. First ray of light. Top of the guy's bald head to, well, down, down through the focal point. Parallel, then down through the focal point. Second ray is going to go down through the optical center. And they don't seem like they intersect anywhere on the right-hand side. So what I'm going to do is extend both of those refracted rays. Extend them back here as dotted lines, not as solid lines. For the first time, we're seeing dotted lines now. Problem is, they don't intersect either. What can you tell me about this image? There is no image. There's no image formed. It's kind of wacky. But if you have your object beyond the focal length, you'll see the image on the screen. You move it, you'll change the characteristics of the image on the screen. But if you bring it a little bit closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer to where the focal point is, it will just disappear. The image will just disappear because there won't be an image if the object is at the focal length. Okay, our last ray diagram now for convex or converging lenses. This time we've got our object inside the focal length. So this time DO is less than F. Our first ray goes from your shiny head down through the focal point. The second ray is going to go down through the optical center. They don't converge anywhere on the right-hand side. So let's extend them back. See what happens when I do that. They converge over here as dotted lines. So let's draw our image right there. Characteristics are the attributes of this image. It is... Bigger, smaller, same size. Red compared to black here is, red is bigger, right? Larger, bigger, whatever you want to say there. Is it right side up or upside down? It's right side up, it's upright. Is it real or virtual? It is virtual. So for the first time that I have an image, I could not project it onto a screen no matter what I do. This image cannot be formed on a screen. So how do I see it? I look into the lens in order to see it. Ryan, what's the application of this? It's the magnifying glass. Yeah. When you use a magnifying glass, trying to read newsprint or whatever, you put the lens really close to it so that the object, the print that you're trying to read, is close to the lens, inside the focal length. What do you see? An image that is right side up, and bigger. And what do you got to do to see the image? Look into the lens to see it, not project it onto a screen. So you can use the same lens as a magnifying glass as you do in a theater. We just place our object in a different spot. That's all. In a theater, we place the object between F and 2F. In a magnifying glass, we place our object in between F and the lens itself.
I want to draw one more for you here. If you flip your page over, you've got five on the back, but I'm going to make you draw the last four yourself. All five of those are what we call concave or diverging lenses. I'll draw the first one, and then the other four should be pretty straightforward for you to draw yourself because they're going to end up being pretty much the same as the first one. We're going to make this F and this 2F. We don't even need to label the spacers on the other side this time. First ray is going to reflect off of this guy's bald head. It's going to refract when it hits the lens. It's not going to refract down here because it's not a converging lens. It's diverging. It's not going to refract down here because that would be reflection, not refraction. Rather, it's going to refract up here as if it's diverging away from the focal point, as if it's going away from F. The second ray that I'm going to draw is from the top of this guy's head down through the optical center. And just like for the convex or converging lens, it's going to go straight through and follow the same path as it had when it struck the lens at. If we extend that one back, we can see two dotted lines intersect. Now, the reality is I don't usually draw that one extended back because I know that these two lines are intersecting there, right? The only reason I did that, the only reason I showed this one extending back along the original path is to show you that it's dotted lines that are intersecting. And that's important, as you'll see in a moment here. Characteristics, it's smaller. It's upright. And it's real or virtual? It's virtual. You're going to find when you draw the next four diagrams that the exact placement of it might change a little bit. The exact size of it might change a little bit. But the three general characteristics will not change. No matter where you put your object, if you have a convert, convex, sorry, diverging or concave lens, you will always produce an image that's smaller, upright, and virtual. There is no way to produce a real image with this type of lens. Okay, anybody ever watch Survivor? TV show Survivor? Okay. Is it? Yeah. I, I haven't watched it in years. I haven't watched it in years. But, um, you know, one thing that I've that I've thought is like, you know, you become a contestant on Survivor. You need to be you need to be farsighted. You need to have reading glasses. That's what you need, because it seems like at least when I used to watch it, it would always seem like, you know, on Survivor the first day it was all about getting fire, all about getting fire so you could cook food and boil boil water and so on and so on and so on. My glasses would be useless because my glasses cause rays of light to diverge. I always produce a virtual image. But if I have reading glasses, which are converging lenses, then rays of light will, will come together. All I have to do is focus my converging lens on the sun and then put my kindling the focal length away from the lens and all the rays of light that are coming from the sun will converge at that spot and start a fire. Can't do it with this kind of lens, because you can see these rays are always going away from each other. All right, I'm going to give you a few minutes, the rest of class, in fact, to uh, draw the rest of these ray diagrams, the, the remaining four. You will find the characteristics are the same. So if you, if you, if you get an answer that's not the same, um, you've made a mistake. Call me over if you're having a little bit of trouble with it. Otherwise, that's it for the day.